Uh, John Sherholtz is president of the Atlanta Braves. He joined the Braves in 1990 and became the Cubs president in 2008. Prior to joining the Braves, he spent 22 years with the Kansas City Royals and nine years there as general manager. He's a native of Baltimore, graduate of Baltimore City College and Towson University where they named the baseball facility after him. He published a book in 2006 uh, called, named, Built to Win and most importantly, and I, I think sometimes when we're in Atlanta and we see the Braves win year after year, we get kind of, we get kind of all well, you know, another winning season. But in, during John's tenure, uh, the Atlanta Braves have won their division 15 times. So that tells you something about the organization. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. John Sherholtz. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, I was supposed to be here, I think it was a Ken, two years ago. Um, Ken and I usually meet and discuss these invitations at his home, usually at an engagement party or a reception for one of our children or their fiancés, and it's usually over the, uh, the entertainment area, the bar, that we talk about this. <laughs> and he gets me at the perfect time. He said, I, he's, a, he's perfect for me to ask him to come speak. I agreed to speak, but unfortunately I had to change for a personal reason last time, so I'm glad to be here and, and glad that, uh, as, as, as was said, um, to be in good, friendly company in this entire room, I know, but especially this table of my friends from Cobb County sitting right here in the front. <laughs> so thank whoever had that sitting arrangement, I really appreciate that. I, I, have, I have comfort, and I'm, I'm sure there's comfort in the entire room. Uh, ordinarily, or what I was intending to do when I was invited to come and accepted that invitation for this morning was to talk about uh, what was mentioned in the introduction, and that is um, the great legacy and the great record of your Atlanta Braves. Um, Built to Win, the book that I wrote in 2006, tried to capture that uh, remarkable achievement by this great organization full of wonderful people, which, by the way, is my, is my number one uh, important tenet. Uh, in, in management philosophy and leadership, how to become a successful organization, how to put together a successful team. It boils down for me to the people you hire and, and then how you, how you manage them and how you train them and how you empower them and how you honor them and how you support them and how you stand out of their way and let them work, as, which is what I have done as a general manager. I was a general manager for 26 years, uh, those years in Kansas City followed by the 17 here. Um, with, with, with the Braves. I was going to talk about that. I was going to talk about player personnel matters, which might be of interest to some of you here this morning. And, and we likely would have talked about Brian McCann or, or, or Tim Hudson or Freddie Freeman or Andrelton Simmons or Chris Johnson or who's going to catch or who's going to be your, on your pitching staff. What trades are you going to make? And I'm sure none of those questions are on your mind this morning. <laughs> but if they are, I'll give you as, as, as good an answer as I can when we get to that that, that point of the program. But in its place, in its place, if you've read the papers, if you've been awake, <laughs> if you've listened to the radio, there, there has been a, a, a major announcement made by our organization, and that is several weeks ago, uh, I personally and another gentleman, Mike Plant, you've seen his name in the paper a couple of times, met with Mayor Reed and, and informed him uh, and I began, I began the conversation in this fashion. Since the Atlanta Braves uh, have been in Atlanta some 45 years, we have always had a respectful and honorable relationship with the office of mayor uh, of Atlanta. And it is with that spirit that we come here to um, advise you in a very honest and respectful fashion that at the end of our lease at Turner Field, uh, December 2016, we will not be remaining, but we will be moving to Cobb County. Now, let me talk a little bit about that. This, this didn't come to us in, in a flight of fancy some night. We've, we've been working on this matter for quite some time. And, and to the mayor's great credit, uh, he understood that. He was, he was disappointed and stunned and shocked when I said those words to him. But we tried and they tried, and I'm going to take the high road because I think that's the appropriate thing to do. Both sides tried as best they could to get a deal done. Our lease expires at the end of 2016. It takes quite a bit of time to plan, to design, 
uh, and to put all of the elements in place to build a major league stadium. Uh, it, you can't do it just when somebody, your lease expires and then next year you have a brand new ballpark somewhere. So we began searching for what would be an appropriate place for us to find as an alternate location to Turner Field. Which, by the way, I have to say, Turner Field, given all of the struggles that those of you who come to games, and I'm sure many of you do, with, as it relates to access, as it relates to traffic, as it relates to aggravation, as it relates to agitation, all of the, all of the emotions that you, you, you feel when you're in your car and you can't get to a parking lot, um, we, we, feel, we feel that too. We hear that from, I hear from my friends, my good friends in, in town. I hear it from fans all of the time. But we also hear, on the positive side, what a wonderful environment it is inside Turner Field. Once you get that parking out of the way, once you get through the traffic, once you, your blood pressure begins to, to decrease a bit, you get in that, inside that facility and we provide for you a beautiful, beautiful environment for your friends, your family, your neighbors to watch a baseball game. It's a beautiful stadium. We continue to beautify it every year, and, and that's the vow we make. We, we, have been, we have been called by Commissioner Bud Selig the gold standard Major League Baseball organization, um, not only because of our consistent commitment to excellence on the field, which I think we've demonstrated. You can't win every year. Everybody knows that. You can't win every year. You can't win every game. But you can certainly make a commitment, a constant and continual commitment to excellence. And, and we've done that, not only with the team, not only with the abilities of the team that we put on the field, but with the character of the people who wear our uniform. The uniform is going to, is, has said for years, Atlanta across the front, and, and when we relocate 12 miles up the road to Cobb County, it will continue to say Atlanta across the front. We represent this region. We represent this great state of Georgia. We represent actually the southeastern United States. We are the southeastern United States team. Uh, and so we're proud of that. But we have responsibility to, to uphold that. So when you come into our ballpark, each and every year, we have made a concerted effort to enliven, improve, uh, make, enhance your, your experience and your environment so that not only watching a good baseball team play and win 96 games as we did last year and finish only one game out of first place to those, those aggravating St. Louis Cardinals, and <laughs> who I tip my cap to because they do a great job, um, but we, 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 every year, we, we say to you, we're making a commitment. I have, a, I have a, a, a leadership and management slogan that I've lived most of my life with, and that is winners make commitments and losers make excuses. When I joined the Atlanta Braves from the Kansas City Royals, now you have to know this, when I was in Kansas City, we were regarded as the IBM of the American League, the, the blue chip stock. We were, we were consistent, we were highly regarded, we had a great organization. We won a lot of games. Uh, we, we committed ourselves to that excellence that I was talking about, and we were highly regarded. And when I, I have to tell you, when I, when I made the decision after 26 years, 23 years there, to join the Atlanta Braves in 19, the winter of 1990, a team that had finished last three years in a row, coming from the IBM of the American League, who's, who's, who's this is the only major league team the year previous not to draw a million fans. Less than a million fans came to Atlanta Braves games uh, in 1990. Um, and that, that was said. And so I got a lot of phone calls, a number of phone calls from my friends in the industry saying, have you lost your mind? You're going to Atlanta. And by the way, it's the worst playing surface in all of baseball. Well, we fixed all that. We fixed all that not by giving excuses for it. We grabbed it by the horns. We made the commitment. We made the change. And we don't have to look back. And now some 23 years later, here we are as the commissioner's gold standard baseball organization on all of baseball, the Atlanta Braves. And we're still going to be known as the Atlanta Braves. We'll just play 12 miles further up the road in a beautiful, beautiful facility, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. But before that, I want to, I want to just tell you the commitment we've made to make Turner Field what it is. We were motivated by not only because we care about and we have pride in about what our organization, how it's viewed, uh, not only in our community, in our region, but throughout the game of baseball. So that's what drove our commitment. This is how we all work. This is what each individual in the Atlanta Braves gets up every day feeling, whether it's the, the, the youngest and newest member of our staff, a trainee, or an old veteran who's been around for years. This is how we get going every day at work. This is, this is the kind of focus we have and the vision that we have every year. Now you want to talk about vision, 
a lot of people at this table to my left right here had great vision. Not long before the Atlanta Braves were a gleam in the eye of Cobb County. Let me just say that. They started planning transportation projects. You've read about them. I read about them. I know about them well now. They have more on the board as a result of our decision. They, they, they're thinking ahead. They're looking, they're looking ahead. Uh, they weren't shocked by this. They were pleased by this, I'll say. I think I could say that, gentlemen. And the reception that I had the other night uh, at the Chamber of Commerce Director's Dinner, which I really appreciated, uh, reflected that. So th th this, is, this is the attitude that permeates our region, our city, our state. This is a great, this is a great state. And, and we, we try to reflect that every day. That is our commitment. That is, that, that is what we vow to do as an organization. Um, on some sides of this issue, in this decision, it was difficult because we've had such remarkable memories and such remarkable experiences uh, at both Atlanta Fulton County Stadium uh, and Turner Field. I can remember standing on the rail uh, on the new Turner Field and watching Atlanta Fulton County implode. I was there watching that happen. And that was sad because there was a lot of great memories. Major League Baseball comes to Atlanta. They play in Atlanta, Fulton County. No one thought we'd ever get over that. No one thought we'd ever get over losing Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. We did. We did. And we have Turner Field, a more modern, a more useful, a more friendly, um, more spacious, upgraded uh, concessions, upgraded parking, and, and our game day attendance, the people who you greet when you come, when you get out of your car, when you finally get out of your car at Turner Field. The first person that you see, I guarantee you, and you'll, you'll agree, is nice, is friendly. What can I do? And accommodating. And when you walk through the gates, everyone who meets you meets you with a smile. How can I help you? Where are you seated? What do you, what do you need? Is there anything we could do? And as you go to your seat, the friendliest, nicest uh, game day staff in baseball, in my experience. And, and that's important to us. And I get more letters about that than I do about trades that our general manager has made. As, <laughs> as an old general manager, I, I, he knows not to read those letters. Because you, you never get a good letter. If you, if you make a really good deal, you don't hear from anybody who's like, wow, that was a heck of a deal, Frank. Way to go. Or John, nice, nice trade. No. When you make what they think is a bad deal, they'd be sure to, they're sure, certain to tell you how they feel about that. And isn't that true today with this, with this very, very circumstance uh, I'm going to talk about a bit. So um, I'm bouncing around, but I'm going to leave time for you for a lot of, a lot of or whatever amount of questions you have and answer them as, as, as forthrightly as I, as I can. Um, we are so thrilled by the possibility of this move. We love Atlanta. It's a great city, and we're proud to represent it. And we're going to continue to represent the great city of Atlanta. We're going to be located in Cobb County in this great regional expansion of, of, this, of this area. We're, we're, we're not just the city of Atlanta. We're the city of Atlanta and a lot of dynamic, visionary, growing, committed, winning communities. And we're moving to one of them. Um, I have to be truthful. I went to the Chamber of Commerce dinner the other night and I, and I said to my wife that started at five, the reception part started at five, and I said, I, I want, I'm not gonna get there too early, so I'm gonna try to be fashionably late. So I left five minutes till five from my house in Vinings. I pulled up and Brooks met me at, at one minute till five. So I'm a little biased about where the stadium's gonna be. <laughs> but truth be told, I want it on the record, I had nothing to do where, where we located this stadium. We just found this beautiful, um, uh, forested 82 acres of land in the midst of this dynamic growing community, uh, the intersection of I-75 and I-285. And, and the plans for it, we have made preliminarily. We have not yet finalized and decided on our final architectural choice. We, we've been working with HKS. We've been working with HKS uh, on a consulting deal, but uh, soon we will open up that, that process. But we didn't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because we have a big vote coming up on the evening of the 26th of November. And, and we could not be so presumptuous to assume that the commissioners will approve. We, we, we hope they will. Uh, as I said the other day, we hope they will, we think they will, we feel they will, and we pray they will. Because we think this will be a remarkably wonderful development for all of Atlanta. I'm a Cobb County, as you just heard. I'm a Cobb County, proud of it. And, and we're not crazy about taxes. We, I mean, one of the reasons I moved to Cobb County, I like I liked that whole tax basis thing. I like that. So that's why I moved there. So we're not real crazy about increasing anybody's tax base. Um, 
and whatever tax increases that someone may uh, be impacted by will be so de minimis they will hardly register, uh, in my view. So uh, we're excited about this, and, and I'm happy to talk about Let me give you a few of the elements of the deal. Um, you read about them in the paper this morning, so I'm just going to reiterate that. And as I said a moment ago, this was not just an, e an easy decision. Well, we've been in Turner Field. We've been downtown. We're not really downtown. We're sort of our own oasis off of downtown. We're not in downtown Atlanta. We're not, certainly not in midtown Atlanta. We're, we're in that oasis of Turner Field, around which there is not much else. We tried, I'm backing up a bit, we tried to do what we could to convince the city to allow us to develop the land around Turner Field for a variety of reasons, some of which were legal, some of which were legislative. Um, they, they were not able to give us that right they, and, and did not give us that right. So we were concerned. Part of the traffic issue that you face and a lot of people face at Turner Field is that you, there's no reason to come early. If you wanted to spread out the traffic flow coming in to a stadium like Turner Field where it's located off, off of the, the connector and only one way in and one way out pretty much, uh, you come, if you could come a little early and go to a restaurant, go to a, go to a sports bar, go to some place, a nice place to relax and beat the traffic and, and get your blood pressure down to where it should be to enjoy a baseball game, go to the baseball game, and if you choose to stay after that game, uh, you can do that and the traffic begins to slowly flow and gradually get out of the, of the facility. So we can do that where we're moving. We, that will happen because not only are we going to build a stadium, a world-class, finest major league stadium ever built, ever designed, ever constructed, but with it, at the very same time, will be phase one of our development. Phase one will likely be restaurants, um, um, uh, some, some sports memorabilia, or not memorabilia, sports stores, um, um, maybe, maybe a, a small motel or hotel or something like that, but it's mostly going to be for fan interest and fan entertainment and fan joy, where you can get there early, have a burger, have a meal, and, 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 and easily and comfortably go to the game after that. And not, no, other, no other major league sports uh, facility in baseball has been built where coming out of the ground at the same time as a stadium and the first phase of a development plan. And beyond that, we have more grandiose ideas about what, what will go into, into the, uh, the subsequent phases of our development. But coming out at the very same time, when the shovels are in the ground and the bulldozers are, are moving, they're going to build the stadium and phase one of our development. Which, by the way, um, our, our goal, our commitment to this is the beautification of this site, or the beauty of this site, which you can see if you're in a, in a high uh, on the high floor of one of the office buildings where we're, we were the other night. It's a gorgeous piece of property. We intend, we intend to honor that. We intend to keep it that way. We're going to have to take trees out, but we're going to put that many trees and more back in. And we're going to beautify this entire setting uh, uh, so that it represents what we in the Southeast get to enjoy all the time. This beautiful, this beautiful environment, this beautiful climate, uh, these beautiful trees, the dogwoods and the azaleas and magnolias and all that's what we intend to make as, as sort of our signature piece for this for this location and and we're we're excited about that and committed to that um and you know we don't own turner field we we couldn't make those decisions for ourselves about what we knew what we wanted to do around turner field but um we we did we don't own it we're, we're simply tenants we we pay a lease cost and Remember, Turner Field was built for about a three-week Paralympics and Olympics venue. And it was built uh, in that fashion. We've, we've supplemented it to the tune of a hundred and plus million dollars when we moved in and made it, made it our place. Uh, the Atlanta Braves did that. When I say we, it was the Atlanta Braves who paid that uh, to beautify it, to, to enhance it, to make it as good as it can. And we continue to do that. But we, we had no... Um, we had no right to do what we wanted to do. We only had the opportunity to request that somebody partner with us, the city, and perhaps the state. But it never got to the state level. So anyhow, I wanted to, I wanted to make that clear. Um, the problem, the major problem that we all suffer, we, you Braves fans and, and we, when we hear from our, our fans, is, is there was, there's never been mass transit. The, the stadium, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium was built in 1965. And there was never a spur, a MARTA spur, no, no 
decision was ever made to bring mass transit to that sports venue. We're both, at one time, the Falcons, and then when we came to town, um, the Braves played their games there. So it, it became, and the more our population grew, the more our, the number of automobiles grew, the, the worse and more problematic the traffic problem became because there was really no mass transit, no, no public transportation to get people to the site. We just never had that. And we still don't have it. Uh, although we, did, we, have, we, have, we do have the MARTA buses now that, that bring people from five points and so on and so forth. So, so we, we know we're, we're, we're going to have that um, when we get to Cobb County. The, the plans that are, as I said a moment ago, the plans that Cobb County has already, with their, their visionary approach to the growth of their community and managed approach to the growth of their community, they know the importance of transportation. And they're not going to be shocked by it. And they're not going to be shocked by what impact having a stadium added to uh, into the mix will, will cause it. Um, you know, it's a $672 million project as it relates to the stadium. It's a private-public partnership. Um, there will be our good friends at Cobb County involved. Obviously, the Atlanta Braves are involved. And, and we're, we're hopeful that the state of Georgia will be involved. And we think, we think that will happen. So um, it's, as I said a moment ago, at the, at the intersection of I-75 and 285, and, and it, I, I, can't begin, I can't begin to tell you how much uh, the traffic issues will be mitigated. There's already, as opposed to the one access point we have at Turner Field, there are 14 different ways you can get in to this site um, by car, by, by ha however you choose to come. There are 14 different access points to this facility. So that will, that will solve a lot of our problems. That will lower a lot of our blood pressures as we, as we I'm going to have to drive a full four and a half minutes, but, but <laughs> bear with me on that one. But um, anyhow, that, that's really, that's really uh, we're, we're thrilled. We're thrilled. We met uh, a couple of days ago. Um, our senior executive team met with Liberty Media. Liberty Media is our parent company. You know that. that from Denver, Col Colorado, the, the giant media uh, consortium. Uh, run by John Malone and his and his top brass, brilliant guys all. Uh, we were together to do our annual Braves budget review with them, and uh, they have been with us all along the way. They have been supportive of everything we've discussed about this this remarkable, dynamic Cobb County Atlanta Braves uh, project. But at this meeting, they went to a higher level. I mean, they are so thrilled and so excited about what we're doing and what they see uh, as, as, as the excitement and the value and the impact, positive impact to the community. And, and, and um, so they're all in as, as much as a parent company can be. And we're thrilled by that because not, these people are smart people. They've made a lot of investments in developments and land holdings and so on and so forth, as well as companies. Um, and they're all in. And that was, uh, that was sort of the last sort of pat on the backside as we, as we were going into this project. As my good friends here from Cobb County know, uh, we, we face some immediate, not unexpected, by the way, as it never is, as I told you before, when you, when you make a deal as a general manager, the people who like it stay quiet. The people who don't like it, you hear about. Uh, we're not, this was not unexpected, and, and, and it's appropriate. This is, this is America. People have a right to view, to, to express their view and, and give their opinion. We think that at, at the end of the day, our, our view and our opinion and, and our facts and, and the substance of our project will, will win out just on its merits. Not because we want it so badly or, or, or Cobb County wants it, but because it really makes a lot of sense for Atlanta and for the state of Georgia and for the Southeast and for, and for uh, the, the convenience and, and comfort uh, and excitement. Uh, this place, this, this mixed use development that will be adjacent to our, to our stadium will not be open just for the 81 game, home games that we play. But for the entire year, it will be a destination, a joyful, uh, wonderful, fun location for people who come to town for whatever reason. It might not be a Braves game. It might be a Falcons game. It might be a convention. It might be something, whatever it may be, business trip. They're going to find their way because they're going to hear about it, and they're going to know that it's high end and it's high quality, and they want to go see what this place is like. So we're, we're, we're thrilled. Um, so I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled as the president of this team to have the role that I have in it. And, and we are, just to let you look behind the curtain a little bit, we are now planning our sort of uh, 
facilities tour. Uh, I've seen most every baseball, uh, Major League Baseball facility. I'm pretty much every minor league baseball facility, so I know what they look like and I know what they offer and I know what we can use out of that. But our group is going to get on a plane with some architects and some other people, and we're going to go visit a lot of the newer sites, some sites that are being built as we speak, both not only in baseball, but um, our guys want to look at some football stadiums to see what the hospitality space looks like, see what the, what the modern, newer uh, uh, concepts are out there. And so we're going to have a, we got a wide open canvas. Uh, it's, 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 it's clean for us to design and build, have built what it is that we want to have for our fans and for our community. And, and we're so excited about it. Uh, and we're going rapidly. We, we did this. We got to where uh, we are with the MOU having just been signed a few days ago in about three months time. Ordinarily, ordinarily a project like this takes three years or at least three years. And then you have all of the vetting uh, throughout that process. We've seen a little of that with the Falcons issue, issues, uh, and that takes time. But once we, we felt like it would be impossible for us to get what we, th we believe is, is, is uh, deserved in our community and by our fans, especially our fans, everything we've done, the first and foremost focus we have had is what, makes this a more, what will make this a more enjoyable experience for our fans. That was the primary in everything we've done. And I think, I think we're going to accomplish that. Uh, it, it was, it, so usually it takes three, three years or more to get done. Um, when we found a, a partner in Cobb County, they were as interested in moving forward as we were. Uh, some of the deliberations have been called secretive. That's how they were characterized. Which if you didn't want to be, you know, uh, have a sort of a negative tent to it, you might have said confidential. But you, confidential becomes secretive if you don't like the deal. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I used to write in my college paper, so I know how you can make things sound if you, if you wish. But, um, so we're delighted. We, we are, we sta I stand here today at a good place. We are not over the finish line yet. That will be Tuesday night. And as I said a moment ago, we are, we are very confident and, 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 uh, and, and, and so waiting for the right to go forward and get this project underway. This is a great organization, the Atlanta Braves. This is a great city, Atlanta, Georgia. This is a wonderfully dynamic and forward-thinking and visionary region of our state. Um, at our church that I attend, we've had a sort of a, a, a development meeting over the last couple of years, and one of, one of uh, the members on our committee, Paul Rosser, you may know Paul, um, great developer in town for many, many years, stood up and said, in 50 years, he said, and most of us won't be here for that, but in 50 years, uh, this, this town and the energy and the dynamic of this town are going to be just like Fifth Avenue in New York. That's what's happening in the Southeast. And Atlanta is the, is the focal point of that. That's what's going to happen. And we think this project will add to that. We are, we are a dynamic, visionary growth region with all positive plans, and we're excited to be a part of it. So. Thank you for inviting me today, and I will answer any questions you may have, whether it's about the team, whether it's about the general manager, the president, uh, whatever you want to ask me. So thank you all very much. Bob? If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll get you a microphone because we're on a, a live stream and we're recording for the web, website. So we need for you to get a microphone before you ask a question. And we can't afford McCann because Liberty Media is telling you how much money you can spend and they, they get involved in stadium deals. Talk about dollars and budgets and so forth and your relationships. Sure. Happy to. L Liberty Media has, um, has seeded all management decisions of the Atlanta Braves uh, from the day they purchased us to Terry McGurk, our chairman. And Major League Baseball demands that, that there be a local... Um, direct person in charge of the franchise. The decisions to, for the well-being of the franchise are made by the people who operate boots on the ground uh, in, in this organization, and that's how we operate. Um, we have not once ever, in the time that Liberty has owned us, even when Ted owned us, um, had an owner impose his will 
on anything that we've done. We make our budgets, we spend what we earn. And what we do is whatever we earn, whatever profit we generate, usually is, for, is pushed right back into our product, creating our team, because that is what we sell. We sell excellent baseball. So what we make, we reinvest. We reinvest it inside Turner Field, we beautify it, we, we, we uh, improve the conditions, and they have not once ever um, stopped us from making any decision that we wanted to, wanted to go forward with, whether it's in, in regard to personnel, whether it's in regard to the budget of our team, how much our payroll is. Um, next year we'll be at $100 million on our major league pay, play, payroll. So, uh, and we keep going up. And, and all they have done is said, job well done, we support you, um, and that's it. So we operate on our own. And Mr. McGurk is the final say and is our ownership representative with Major League Baseball. Good morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning. Um, first off, I want to say thanks. Uh, you've forgiven me an amazing amount of pleasure for the past 35 years, or for you, 23 years in watching the team. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I do have a question about revenue and payroll. Um, from what I understand, next year the TV deal goes up. The teams will be making maybe an extra 40 million-ish each starting in 2014. Is there a way, did you foresee the Atlanta Braves payroll getting closer to the top? I know you said it just went up to 100, and which is not insignificant. It's probably slightly above the middle is my guess. But it, percentage-wise, it's dropped pretty far behind compared to where it was in the mid-90s. Um, and certainly as a fan, I'd love to see us try to get that closer to the top. Well, where we were in the mid-90s was out of whack to what our income was. We were overspending in the mid-90s, so we decided that we're going to be able, and, and if you look at our record from the mid-90s going forward, it's been, it's been pretty darn good. We just operate more, more effectively and efficiently and, and uh, appropriately from a financial standpoint. Um, and so I have no excuses to make on that. Nine, $100 million, can put, you can put a winning team on the field for $100 million. We're, we're, we're still ranked in about uh, the 15th, 14th or 15th, level team in terms of revenue and in terms of our expenses. So we're right where we belong. Um, everybody's going to get more money, not just the Atlanta Braves. I mean, tele the television uh, contract is going to impact all 30 teams. And so as we rise, so too do the teams above us rise uh, on, on, the, on a like percentage. So we're, we're, we, we don't ever use money as an excuse for why we can't put a winning team on the field. We, we, we commit to putting a winning team on the field. Uh, instead of excusing ourselves why we couldn't do it. I, I, I'm not, I'm not, that's, that's how we work. That's how we work. So you're, we're going to have a good team on the field this year, too. We lost, we lost McCann. We lost Hudson. Um, and, and, they're, and they're big leadership losses, but young guys are going to step up who have, we're going to have new leadership roles, and that's what happens um, with teams. Yes, sir? Um, you actually just kind of segue into my question. With the loss of Tim Hudson and with the possible loss of Brian McCann, who in your opinion do we have now that's going to step up into that leadership role? And with that particular player, what qualities do you think they're going to bring to the team to step up to say that, hey, I'm now going to be the leader, the face of the Atlanta Braves organization, and this is what I'm going to do day in and day out to prove that I'm the leader for this team? Right. L leadership um Leadership is, is a sort of internal. It comes internally. You can't decide who's going to be the leader. That, that comes as a natural process. Uh, our roster is not finally formed either. Frank Wren and his guys are still working and will work all the way up until spring training, putting that team together. It might be that a player who has acquired uh, this winter or early spring or those couple of players might be those who have uh, experience and have had success and, and, are, and are, are regarded highly by by players and, and that leadership role comes naturally to them. Or it might be one of the young players in our organization. It might be Andrelton Simmons, who I think has a chance to be a remarkable leader someday. And he's already the most remarkable defensive shortstop I think I've ever seen. Um, Terry Pendleton said he's Isaac Smith with a better arm. You know, so for those of you, you baseball fans here, and that's pretty high praise. Uh, um, you know, we, we'll have guys, I mean, Jason Hayward is a, is a dynamic, uh, wanting to win a, a play on the edge, um, competitive guy, and he has leadership qualities that he'll that he'll share. And, and 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 if there's a void, it'll be filled. No professional sports team or any sports team uh, has a void of leadership that isn't filled from within their, the clubhouse or the locker room. That just happens. It's that inertia that comes out of the group of men who are gathered together to make up that team. We can't assign 
somebody as having leadership qualities and say, okay, you're going to be our leader. I can't tell you that. But you have to have those kind of guys. You have to have, I've always believed as a general manager trying to put a team together that the mix of the players is far more important than the individual skill level of each individual player. You might have the best player at each position, but if they don't blend together well, if the, if the strength of the fabric of your team is, is not strong enough, instead you have all of these individual uh, threads that don't work together, you can have the highest payroll in the world and still not win, as the Yankees demonstrated for years. <laughs> My good friends at the Yankees. So, so leadership is, is, is comes internally with its own inertia out of a clubhouse where guys get to know each other and see each other in spring training and, 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 and it, it comes naturally that way. Anybody over here this? Uh, this question really uh, revolves around Brian McCann, but uh, what are your thoughts on the DH rule and do you see it as uh, inevitable that it ends up in the National League? I've never been a fan of the uh, DH, uh, except when I was a general manager in the American League. <laughs> I mean, there's only two leagues in the world that don't have the DH. And I think from an economic standpoint, which goes back to this gentleman's question, I think, and I mentioned it to the commissioner of this last ownership meeting in, in Orlando, uh, I'm the chairman of the Instant Replay Committee, and you may have read that the owners voted unanimously to uh, have Instant Replay in Major League Baseball next year in a historical fashion, so I'm proud of that. But while there, um, we talked about, I talked to the commissioner about the DH. I said, we're losing talent that's marketable and valuable and one-dimensional, perhaps, but to the American League. Uh, they can't play in the National League because they have to get on the base, and Pujols demonstrated that the last couple of years he was in St. Louis. He was injured, of course, but, but they still have value, and they still can generate runs, and fans still like to see runs scored. I think, I should bite my tongue before saying this, I think that in fairness to all 30 teams, the National League uh, w should have their chance to be able to sign those kind, those kind of players, which means the designated hitter will likely, should likely be in both leagues. That's the only fair way to alter it. Can't make the players have more physical ability or more athleticism. Can't do that, but they have value. They have value. And we'd like to have, you know, a shot at Albert Pujols or Big Poppy. Uh, John, could you talk about how you came to the number of 41 to 42,000 seats in the new stadium based on where we are now with our numbers and then the attendance that we have, about 31,000 average? Yeah, we, we've talked about that a lot, and, and, and we just felt like um, we had 50,000, we have 50,000 here, and, and we were able to measure how many, what our no-show rate was and, uh, and how few uh, tickets we sold from the maximum. And uh, we believe that a, a cozier, um, a smaller seating bowl creates more demand on your tickets. And uh, on average, we have about 37,000 people, so we can accommodate, accommodate that easily. I do believe, as we continue to, to improve our team, we're, we're going in at 41.5, and I, I, I wake up at night saying, you know, should it have been 43, should it have been 45? But too many seats would go unused if, that's, if that were the case, and we want to, we want to stop that. We, we, you know, we're not going to have a Wrigley Field, Fenway Park environment where, you know, there's so few seats that people go online to try to buy tickets two years in, in advance, but we're going to have a demand for our seats. There will be times when we, we don't have enough tickets to accommodate our fans, and, and that'll happen. Uh, it'll happen infrequently, I think, except in the playoffs when you never have enough tickets. We, we had a 50,000-seat stadium here, and we could have sold far more tickets when we were in our heyday in the mid-90s, early 90s and mid-90s. So I think this is a good number. I like it. I think, I think it will feel good for the fans who are there too. You're always going to have, the stadium is going to feel full. You're going to, you're, it's going to be a lot, of, a lot of support for the Braves and it's going to be more compact and interest, compact in terms of feeling good. There's still going to be spacious concourses and great food and beautiful trees and wonderful shops to visit and 14 ways to get in and out. All good things. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could spend a couple of minutes um, discussing. It's one thing for an organization and people to say, we commit to excellence. It's another thing to consistently produce that. And I was wondering, you kind of teased us with, in the beginning, 
what you plan to talk about, I was wondering if you could discuss a little bit about how, you know, um, maybe some concrete things of how, you, how the Braves have been consistently able uh, to produce excellence. Um, I think it's the people. It goes back to the people you hire. It's always been my secret to success, is the people that I hire who have knowledge, who have commitment, who have um, instincts, who know how to do their jobs, whatever it may be, whether it's um, deciding on which players ought to be part of your organization, an amateur scout or a professional scout who says, get this guy in a trade. Um, you listen to those people. You empower them. You listen to them. Uh, and you make your decision. You're the final filter as a general manager. And, and that's how you, you consistently pursue and achieve excellence as an organization in baseball. You have good people who provide you with good information and you process it. You're the final filter. You're the last guy that has to decide, okay, I heard all of these opinions and, there's, and, and they, they may vary and you have to decide which is the right way to go. Sometimes you choose wisely, sometimes you don't. Um, and I think it's about that. I think it's about having good people, listening to good people, uh, honoring them and utilizing them uh, to make your decisions. And, and that goes upward too from where I am, president to chairman up to our ownership. Though that same kind of uh, operational thinking occurs from this level downward and from this level upward. So it, it seems simplistic. I don't know how I can give you concrete information, but the concrete, the concrete, uh, look at the record, look at the record of the Atlanta Braves. And it's a baseball team. You, you get measured on your excellence by how many games you win in one year, how many times you win over a, a series of years. And as most of you know, we won 14 consecutive division championships in our heyday. That's never been done before, and it's never been done since by any team, no matter how much payroll they had. I keep coming back to that, but <laughs> I'm not sensitive about it because we, maybe a little, but, but we're increasing our payroll, and we stay up with the times. But so it, that's as concrete as I can, I, I can be. It's, it's who, who your people are, who, who your leadership is, how strong they are in their, in their programs, and how well they can motivate and lead the people who work for them and challenge them and, 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 and keep uh, surround themselves with really talented and committed people. That's what I've done. This young lady here. Oh, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the transportation issues. Where does GDOT stand on this? Where does MARTA stand? Well, MARTA stands on the sidelines for us. I mean, they, we, we have not been able to get MARTA to Turner Field and we've had nothing to do about that except request it, and that has never happened. And there have been others beyond us who have asked for MARTA increases. Um, GDOT is very supportive. I can say this from the Atlanta Braves. We've had, we've had some communication with the folks at GDOT. I know our, our good friends at Cobb County have had extraordinary uh, communication with them because of the plans that they put in place uh, and the projects they have now on the books and are being, are being built and those that they see in the future as a result of the Braves coming to Cobb County that will be added. So they're important. I don't know if MARTA or GDOT will have a more uh, impactful role in our new position over the other, but the transportation will be phenomenal. We believe it will answer all of the challenges and all the concerns that we Cobb Countyans have uh, because these people have been forward thinking in their planning. And, and we believe whether it's GDOT or whether it's, it's a MARTA spur or, or whatever it may be, or the or, or the bus rapid transit program, which is going to be a remarkable program with bus transportation all the way from Kennesaw State down into Midtown Atlanta. That's the plan. I mean, just think about that. And it will stop right outside the main entrance, one of the main entrances of our new ballpark. Pardon me for my back. Um, so so uh, we're really, really, really positive about what these folks have done in their, in their transportation plans. Anyone else? Over here. This, this gentleman's got his... Can you speak to uh, baseball's popularity on a macro scale, especially with the younger generation uh, compared to the NFL? Um, I know they're looking at going uh, global into Europe and expanding the game. And personally, uh, when it comes to playoffs in baseball, unless the Braves are in it, I'm already in football mode. So what is Major League Baseball kind of doing to uh, get back some of that popularity competing with other sports? Right. Well, we were America's team for a long, long time. Um, and, and I think 
I think there's a, there's a possibility for that to happen again. Football now is the, is the big dog in the pound. I mean, it, you know, that's no question about that. And the NFL has, has the upper hand by all the stats and all that. We understand that. But we have our share of the marketplace. We're, we're not dismayed by that. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a cyclical circumstance. We had it. We were the number one guy on the block for many, many years, century, not centuries, but decades. And football is now. But America still, I mean, still loves what baseball is. Amer America is a game where you can step off of, of the treadmill, the high speed treadmill of life and go to a baseball game and sit and relax with your friends or your family and enjoy a cold Coke or beer, or whatever you want. And, and just just take a deep breath and watch beautiful athletes, some 700 of the finest athletes that play baseball on major league fields. That's all there is on planet Earth. Those guys represent the finest. And our game stands on its own. And, and by the way, we are proactive in all of the social media out, uh, uh, circumstances. Major League BAM is, is the highest ranked social media outlet in all of the sports, um, advanced media. So, so we're cognizant of having to continue to grow and get the young people. We have become more international. We have far more Latin American players playing at the major league level than we've had before. Uh, we we are, are still dismayed by the, by the diminished number of African-American athletes who are playing our sport. Um, there, there are plans in place to try to get that changed. Um, but, you know, we keep fighting for the good athletes. But other, other sports do too. I mean, soccer ate into our uh, – football first, basketball a little bit. Soccer started too because everybody can play soccer. Put on a pair of shorts and a pair of shoes and a T-shirt. I played soccer, so I can say that. So <laughs> – um, you know, so it's a popular sport. Uh, lacrosse is now taking, you know, is, is, is taking hold. That's a great sport. Uh, I grew up in Baltimore where that's sort of the hotbed of lacrosse. Uh, but we hold our own. We're proud of where we are in the, in the, in the national view of, of the sports fan. And people like baseball. I mean, and, and the commissioner, to his great credit, who's, who's going to retire at the end of uh, 2014, has done a lot. He's, he's had that high on, on his list of priorities. What can we do to keep baseball the most popular game? Our attendance has been up year after year. He's done a good job at that. So there are people, there are a large number of people, maybe not as many to come to the, the what was it, seven or eight home games that the football plays. We play 81 home games. So it's a little easier for people to spread out the number of games they go to uh, in baseball. And so that, that sort of reflects uh, on attendance. But I, I think baseball should be proud of where it stands in the view of, of most good sports fans. So, yes, sir. John, I've got a room full of business people here. My question's more related to the finances than the, the sports team itself. You talked about the cost of the project being $672 million and Cobb County and the state of Georgia being involved. Can you clarify the involvement there and, and then share your thoughts on taxpayer funding? We're, um, we're going to pay the balance? most, the Braves, as it relates to the entire development, that is the stadium and the, and, and the, and the mixed-use development. Cobb County is going to pay the next largest amount. And, and, and we're hopeful that the state will be our partners to some level. We, we, I, I can't say that yet, but we're hopeful of that. And, and, uh, and that's the best, I mean, that's the way it's aligned. I mean, um, we're, we're in for the entire cost of the development is the Braves. That's, that's, those are our costs. We're partners with Cobb County on the cost of the, of the $602 million for the stadium and the parking and all of that. But another thing I'm going to tell you, say about parking. So, I mean, I can't give you any more than that, but I mean, that's, that's really it. We're, we're, we're they're going to be the highest payees in this. Cobb County will be next, and, and to a lesser extent, the state. Um, so, that's not very concrete, but. but. You, you've spoken a lot about the new facility and, and the benefits it'll have on the fans. Talk about, uh, if any, impact that competition played in this move, whether it's uh, competing with other major league baseball teams or, or other sports, uh, football, thinking of the, the new Falcon Stadium or maybe the new stadium mm -hmm. in Dallas, the, mm -hmm. the new Yankee Stadium in New York, things like that. Well, well comp competition is obviously a factor for all of us in any business that we run. I mean, we, we have to be competitive. And, and what's happening generally in major league professional sports, not only baseball, but football and basketball, all these new arenas and modern hospitality areas and sponsorship areas, um, you have to be competitive, and that's why we are we're coming out of the ground with our stadium and our phase one mixed use development, because that attracts people. That that, that makes it more enjoyable for people to come to experience a Braves game. 
uh, it, when they know they can come to an area and, and with their family and friends before the game and, and relax and have a good time there, go to the, see a beautiful baseball, a, a baseball game in this magnificent, beautiful facility that we're going we're gonna to unveil in, in 2017. Uh, but, but we need to generate more, more fans. We need to generate more casual baseball fans, uh, strong baseball fans, people who are visiting the town who aren't baseball fans, but they heard about our development in Cobb County and they want to come see it. So, yeah, we have to be competitive. And, and doing it w the way we're doing it allows us the opportunity to uh, be assured that we can do that and we can be competitive. Yes? Uh, years, these massive cable deals have come into the baseball teams have added a tremendous amount of revenue. The Dodgers are the most recent example. The rumor always was the Braves deal was very poor because it was signed so many years ago. When does the Braves cable deal come up where we can allow that extra revenue to come back to the team? Well, our, our cable deal has been re, redone. Uh, it has been redone about in, in the last year or so. Um, we, were, we were burdened with the worst television deal when we, in the transition between Time Warner and Turner, uh, we were assigned the worst television deal in all of baseball. And we labored under that for quite a long time. It's very difficult to be competitive and put a team together when your television revenue is at the, pretty much at the bottom of the stream. We're now, uh, about mid mid level with with the television rights, the local television rights. We all share equally in the national television rights, but as it relates to the local television rights, we we've managed to increase that, and it's reflective in our in our payroll. Uh, we've been able to be more aggressive and going after some players and do some things. So we we're better off now than we were by a wide margin, but not anywhere near where the top is. Yes, sir. A um, lot of talk about business, a lot of talk about finances. Baseball has a long history of entertaining personalities and engaging stories. What's the best story you could share with us this morning that's fit for public consumption? <laughs> I was standing in Kansas City, uh, our locker room, it was underground, and our locker room, and then there was a service tunnel outside of that, and then a tunnel underground that went from that service tunnel our players came from the clubhouse and walked down under and got up into the, into the dugout. And I'm standing with a, a guy I hired as a scout, Buck O'Neill, great old Negro League manager who lived in Kansas City, managed the Kansas City Monarchs. And we're talking as we talked every day. I brought Buck on board because I, I just had such great admiration for him. And he had been with us a couple of years and we're talking. And all of a sudden he grabs my arm and he says, hold on boss, listen. Bo Jackson's hitting. Now, if you know who Bo Jackson is, Bo Jackson was maybe the greatest athlete. Well, not great, maybe. He was the greatest athlete who ever played Major League Professional Baseball. I mean, this guy was an all-star, I mean, a, a football player at Auburn, sorry, guys. Auburn, <laughs> and sorry, sorry, room. Um, and, and, and everyone thought and he was the number one draft choice for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and he, he was treated so badly by Mr. Hugh Culberhouse in his negotiations his mother told our scout who was out in the field down in Memphis that my son is not going to sign with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He's going to play baseball. So we drafted Bo Jackson. We signed him, and all of a sudden, he, he skyrockets to the major leagues, and, and he had some kind of physical skill. He hit balls further than anybody I've ever seen as a major leaguer. He ran faster than anybody I've ever seen as a major leaguer. He could throw the ball further with more power than anybody I've ever seen as a major leaguer. And I'm standing in the, in the tunnel talking to, to, to Buck about a bunch of things. He says, Hold on, boss. Bo Jackson's hitting. Now, we're underground. He could hear the sound of the ball off of Bo Jackson's bat. And he said, I've only heard that sound two other times. Buck Leonard, uh, Josh, excuse me, Josh Gibson and Babe Ruth were the only two guys that hit a ball harder than that. So thank you all so very much. I think your time is up and my time is up. I'm glad to be here. Thanks, sir. We have a little memento here. Uh, Loretta Eby has uh, sculpted that for you. Thank you. I hope you'll take that home. With, I will. With our thanks for, thanks for your talk. When, Thank you uh, all.